We're here today at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts looking at objects from the 18th and 19th centuries that resonate with the novel Dream of the Red Chamber. I'm Ann Waltner and I'm putting together an online course on the novel Dream of the Red Chamber in conjunction with an English language production of the opera that the San Francisco Opera will be putting on this fall. So I've assembled here a team of two art historians, Katie Ryer and Carol Kuchera, and we have spent a lovely morning looking at objects and we are now going to begin by talking about objects, the way they relate to 18th century China, and the ways in which they relate to the dream of the Red Chamber. So I think the first object that I would like to talk about is an embroidery which is from scenes of the novel Dream of the Red Chamber. The embroidery probably dates from the 19th century and it's really quite a lovely piece of work. Um, we were, I think we were all impressed by the, by the vitality of the colors um, and the, the detail, the nuancing of the colors. One of the things that's interesting about the embroidery is it's not from a particular scene in the novel. Mm -hmm. It's a composite. Um, one of the scenes is uh, of fishing. Um, three of the, of the young ladies are uh, fishing off of a balustrade into a lake. Um, another scene is of Baoyu flying a very lovely butterfly kite. Um, it's, it's, quite, it's quite an interesting, um, it's quite an interesting mm -hmm. piece of work. One of the things that interests me about it is the, is the medium. Mm -hmm. um, embroidery was typically something that women did. Upper class women would do embroidery um, as a useful skill, but also to show off their talent and, and virtue. But it seems likely to me that a piece of this complexity is probably done uh, professionally in a, in a studio. Um, and I think it's, it's important as we look at these embroideries, and there are actually other embroideries currently hanging in the in the galleries here to realize that there there is a professional aspect um, to them as well. Well, and, and we should say a little bit about the format that the size of this work of embroidery and its shape, it's a rectangular uh, piece that's probably about, what, four feet high, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, it's it's the scale of a painting. And yes. And that, that, as Anne mentioned, the you know embroidery while it was women's work to show off skill or to decorate clothing or things like that it was also seen as an art form mm -hmm. and that uh, we were talking about this earlier uh, and quoted the, one of the terms for it is painting with the needle um, so the the way the scene is constructed um, as Anne just mentioned is that um, this is really like a composite sort of illustrate pictorial illustration mm -hmm. in silk of two mm -hmm. or you know, to the a most famous scenes, scenes right yeah. from the novel, so it's um, it's really it's really marvelous, and I think also I think we'll touch on this later. Uh, evidence that representations of this very important novel really can be found on all manner of objects, mm -hmm. from not just something like a, a painting, a painted illustration, or even an embroidered illustration, but you see it decorating porcelain, uh, carved bamboo brush holders um, and other in, in pieces of jade, things mm -hmm. like that too. Mm -hmm. So it mm -hmm. really permeates the visual culture mm -hmm. of, of Qing China. I read in an article that more than 50 artists have done things that still exist that, that represent scenes mm -hmm. from the novel. Um, some of them are, um, are narrative pictures, but a lot of them are simply pictures of individual characters doing iconic things. One of the most famous scenes in the novel, and it's actually also an important scene in the opera, 
is um, Lynn Dayu burying flowers. She's very concerned that flowers not get dirty, and so she collects them and puts them in a silk bag and buries them. And the iconic scene shows sort of this lovely sylph-like, waif-like Lynn Dayu carrying a hoe <laughs> to, to bury flowers. And so that, that's, um, that's an example. One of the things that um, that I was really struck by when I was looking at this embroidery and also looking at um, New Year's prints, especially um, a series of Yang Leo Ching uh, New Year's prints. Yang Leo Ching is a very um, famous house, printing house um, in Tianjin that made really fabulous New Year's prints, is that I think that there are visual relationships mm -hmm. between some of the New Year's prints and the embroidery. And I think that that's especially true in the, in the fishing scene. There's, uh, so I think that there is a way in which we, we see a kind of intertwining in, in, this, um, in these art forms. One of the things that I think is so amazing about the novel is almost immediately people started writing sequels um, women started writing poems about the novel. Um, you know, artists started making visual representations of the novel. And sometimes when I talk about this to students, they kind of say, oh, yeah, that's fan fiction. Right. And, yeah, and I, I, think, I think, and my response to that is, yes, yes, in fact, that's what it is. So there is, there is a way in which this novel kind of provokes a kind of outpouring mm -hmm. in many different media. And Ellen Widmer has actually argued that it changed the way women read because mm -hmm. women were able to insert themselves into mm -hmm. this novel in a way that they hadn't been able to um, in earlier in earlier forms. And I think that the whole, that piece of embroidery on a number of levels, you can read it as Hong Mong, you can read it as Dream of the Red Chamber and these very specific scenes, but you can also read it as just an entree into the women's world. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and we talked a little bit about that, where, where again, as you look at the individual images, the individual figures of the women, they're all dressed in individualized mm -hmm. outfits. Mm -hmm. It's not a generic woman, there are, there are specific right. people peopling that, that embroidered piece of cloth um, and then of course you have people in the know will be able to pick out those scenes specific to the novel right. but a lot of people could just read this as here's right. a, here's a glimpse into this sort of forbidden territory or this right. off limits territory well, and, of and the women's world and you bring up an important point about what what does that world look like mm -hmm. and and in some very large measure, it's the world of the garden, right? Right. And it's attendant architectural structures, and obviously the things that populate uh, those structures. But but that world of the garden, while it can be a man, a man space, because of women's limited mobility and, mm -hmm. and the prohibition against going outside the mm -hmm. household, it becomes the sort of external world uh, for women. Mm -hmm. And then again, all of the uh, sort of mm -hmm. material culture that that. It tends mm -hmm. to garden, you know, gardens mm -hmm. uh, gets loaded into that imagery mm -hmm. too. And some of that crossing over between, as we talked about earlier, the the men's world and the women's world, yeah. the rocks right. that will appear right. in the gardens. This, right. this right. microcosm right. of the the exterior world right. in the garden right. that when then will reappear in the scholar right. studio, right. Well, even smaller. And as world. as uh, you were explaining at lunch, uh, the the fact that the protagonist who is male not only lives within a world of women, but there is a kind of desire to be reborn as a woman, this idea of shedding an expected identity towards mm -hmm. an alternative and women representing that alternative right. is, is very He is the only male in the embroidery. He is also the yeah. only male figure in the opera. Um, and, you know, he does express a desire to be reborn as a woman. And he says things several times in the novel, like girls are pure water, boys are muddy. Mm -hmm. You know, why, why would I want to be with muddy people if I can be with, with right. pure and clear well, people? Well, and actually that's interesting. And, uh, Carol's a Buddhist specialist. I'd like to hear you comment on this idea of reincarnation because it seems to me that there's two different evocations of reincarnation here. The idea of being reborn as a woman on the one hand, but again, then the conceit of the mm -hmm. novel, the other name for the novel is the story, story of the stone, and supposedly Bao Yu is 
is in fact the reincarnation of a rock. So, again, do you have multiple? I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, you can have multiple, multiple reincarnations. But, but you can have what, plenty. You know, what do you think is going on there? That's fascinating. Again, we have the reincarnation out of you know being born out of a rock in a number of Chinese, mm -hmm. you know, fabulous uh, works of literature. Um, what's fascinating to me is that historically men would not want to be reborn That's what I was as thinking, women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, even today within the, the Buddhist hierarchy, that is not the, the right. way to go. The best so thing is to be born, born in China as, as a, man. a man. Or anywhere, <laughs> right? That's the next level up. Mm -hmm. so, right. so he's sort of regressing, mm -hmm. not yeah, progressing. Yeah, I know. That's what's so but interesting. But what, to go back to what you said that, you know, Ellen Widmer mentioned that this sort of empowered women, and it is kind of fascinating to think that here's a man saying no to, you know, to the family, to fortune, to everything in order to take on what at the time was probably considered to be the lesser spot in society, mm -hmm. right? To, to, to move into right. that women's world, which he sees as right. freeing, but all the women are trying to escape in a, same, in a sort of a strange way. So it's, it's, there's lots going on. In yeah, terms of I mean, a, a, a more cynical reading of that <laughs> would be to say that that is precisely why the Jia family his family goes into right. decline. decline? That right. it's, yep. his it's his failure to take on a proper male adult role, right. which means right. that the family spirals into but decline. But to go, to go back to the whole Buddhist thing, mm -hmm. though, failure in this world is not necessarily That's right. failure in the next. But it is right. failure in the next because he doesn't want the superior form of, of, right. of existence. Right. So that's what's so... In, so he's a failure both in Buddhist terms and in Confucian terms if in that he, sense. Yes, he he doesn't desire off. a more enlightened state, state, whether it's scholarly knowledge and then attainment or... Um, yeah. Except in chapter 120, where he both passes a civil service exam and wanders off to become a monk. Monk, right? Okay. So he, he has, <laughs> he does, he has yeah. success on both levels. But but but, but the the role the, the last forty too late. <laughs> the last forty chapters are, I think, almost everyone agrees, not by the same, same author. author. It's so. a, an addition to go for the happy yeah. ending. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah.